What if I told you that I thought the days of needing expensive cooled narrowband cameras in conjunction with just as expensive filters and filter wheels was coming to an end? It might not be here yet, but it's close. And while I know this statement will raise the hackles of some astrophotographers, the proof is in the quality of the images we are now able to capture with inexpensive one-shot color cameras, planetary cameras even. Planetary cameras, just like this Player One Uranus C camera you see featured here, with no other cooling system on it than what Player One calls their active cooling system, which is similar to the cooling fan one finds over the CPU of almost any desktop or laptop computer. By the way, I don't work for Player One. I wasn't asked by Player One to make this video, and I'm quite sure you could accomplish this with other astrophotography cameras. I just happen to like and use Player One cameras. And using that ordinary, uncooled, one-shot color camera in combination with an ordinary 80mm APO refractor telescope and a Skywatcher EQ6R mount, I was able to capture this amazing image of the Cygnus wall. No narrowband filters, no expensive cooled monochrome camera that often costs as much as a good mount, just a good planetary camera, a duoband filter, and a little skill with editing images. It wasn't difficult, but you might need some software that you don't already have. And overall, I'm going to show you how to create such images for yourself. All you need is an ordinary astrophotography rig, a mount, a telescope, and a decent modern one-shot color astrophotography camera. Let's take a quick look at the process. It all begins with a night of imaging. And to create this video, my subject of interest was the Cygnus wall a dramatic and beautiful nebulous region. The hardware I used to shoot this imagery was a Williams Optics ZS81mm telescope, an apochromatic refractor, set on an EQ6RI mount. I'm using PHD2 for guiding, as many of us do, and I'm using Nina for plate solving, framing, and image acquisition. As you already know, the camera at the end of my image train is a Player One Uranus C a modestly priced color camera that they consider to be only a planetary camera, but which has proven itself very good at capturing deep sky objects. On the image train, there is also a reducer and field flattener, a manual rotator, and a simple filter drawer, which is ideal for one-shot color cameras. The filter drawer has a ZWO duoband filter, which I have found to be superb for scrubbing unwanted moonlight out of the sky and reducing many of the effects of atmospheric aberrations. And that's about it. Nothing fancier than that. Now I live in Canada, beyond the 45th parallel, and it's the start of summer right now, and we only get about five hours of astronomical dark. So I don't have a lot of shooting time, but using the duoband filter allows me to start shooting about half an hour before astronomical dark to about half an hour after. The duoband filter allows to pass only the lights emitted by astronomical objects, and thus prevents a great deal of unwanted light from entering the camera. I imaged the target for a grand total of 6 hours using 5 minute subs with a gain of 250 and an offset of 20 and dithering every 3 frames. The dithering is especially important because the software will apply dithering and final stacking to eliminate a great deal of the noise. Now lately I've switched to PixInsight for much of my photo editing because as editors go it's simply more powerful. But I find Serial to be a more flexible stacker. It's simply quicker and easier to use, and maybe that's just due to familiarity, but I still do most of my stacking in Cyril. Once the stacking is done, I can open it in PixInsight and quickly get the image edited to the place where I want it. Whatever video editor you'll use, you'll probably find this part of the process to be pretty standard. You color calibrate the image to get rid of the excess green that often comes with one-shot color cameras, and get the colors balanced right to that portion of the sky. Then you remove the background stars with something like Starnet or Star Exterminator. Then apply a histogram transformation to raise the brightness of the dim target object and a curves transformation to correct the contrast. At this point, you might or might not increase saturation and vibrance depending on the intensity of color that you want. And then, using your astrophotography editor, you reincorporate the stars back into the image. Though, that might be where part of my process is going to differ from the typical. Because, while the stars are still separate from the target image, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to another editor. Many of you are probably more familiar with Photoshop, 
which is a good editor, though in my opinion vastly overpriced, especially given the pay-forever month-to-month subscription plan they have. And I get 99% of the functionality out of my favorite alternative, Affinity Photo, which, in addition not only to being a great alternative, does some things such as removal of unwanted blemishes and objects much better, in my opinion, than Photoshop. And by the way, if you know how to use Photoshop, you'll figure out Affinity Photo in about five minutes. The layout and functionality is very similar. But at this point, I switch to Affinity Photo because it offers very powerful color transformation, composition options, which simply are not found in PixInsight or Serial or any other astrophotography specialized image editing software that I am familiar with. And we can apply its powerful image editing capabilities to transform this lovely but otherwise ordinary photo of the Cygnus wall into something extraordinary, something we might see with narrowband photography only. So Affinity Photo works in layers, and I'm going to start off by duplicating three layers and the original image, which is in the original layer, I'm going to uncheck it and leave it locked so it is never transformed by the editing process. In this way, we can conduct non-destructive editing on the image experiment and get the image just like we want it. Now in a nutshell, what I'm going to do is divide this image up into three layers. The dark region will be one layer. It is filled with dark stardust and stars. And there, I'm going to emphasize darkness by increasing contrast. The mid layer is the diffuse gas roughly from the right center of the image, working its way all the way to the left. And that region of the image, I'm simply going to transform into a bluish hue by selecting its color range and selectively changing its color to a preferred blue. This will help contrast the gorgeous and dramatic cloud structure within the Cygnus wall itself, which is in the lower third left to the lower third right of the image. So in the end, I end up with three layers, a red layer, a blue layer, and a layer that represents contrast and luminance. I'm going to uncheck the contrast and luminance layer so it is not affected by the next step and then simply erase the blue layer from the red layer where I don't want the blue to show up. This leaves the red layer to portray the Cygnus wall and the blue layer to show the background color. Then I check back in the contrast slash luminance layer and voila, we have this. And when we have the final image composited like we want, we add back in our star layer and here, we have the finished image. And while not through narrowband, the quality is very similar. If you were a pixel peeper, you could find some problems with it. In particular, the detail is not quite as fine as you would get with a monochrome camera, but it's close. And as sensors become more and more powerful, having more and more megapixels, that difference is going to become less and less noticeable. Technologically, we are so close to that place right now that the difference between what can be captured with a one-shot color camera and a far more expensive cold monochrome camera complete with a filter wheel and filter set is almost negligible. Now at this point, some persons are probably saying, well, you Photoshop that image, you change the colors. We need to stop and talk for a moment about what colors actually are. See, the simple reality is there is no such thing as colors. Color is a value that our minds assign to certain frequencies of light so that we can perceive them as different from other frequencies of light. Low frequency light is perceived in the reddish bands. High frequencies of light are perceived in the bluish bands. All the other colors that we see are somewhere in between. But the colors themselves are simply perceptions. They don't actually exist. Now what narrowband cameras do is capture four channels of light whenever they're used to take an image. A luminance channel is captured, which captures light and dark. And that's where we get our detail. And then the color channels are captured using filters. Red, green, or blue filters to capture those frequencies of light. Or narrowband filters, which also capture red, green, and blue, just with very narrow specific frequencies of light. Such as H2 filters, which capture the light emitted by ions within emission nebulae. Colors are assigned to each one of the color narrowband channels, usually red for red, green for green, blue for blue, or red for H-alpha, blue for oxygen-3, and green for sulfur. But the assignment of these colors is arbitrary, and they can and are often changed. When we hear of the dramatic Hubble palette, which looks so beautiful, the color assignments for each one of those color channels has been changed. Then the colors are superimposed or composited over the luminance channel to create a beautiful image full of vibrant color and detail. But the thing to understand is those colors are arbitrary. They have been assigned based on the image creator's expectations and preferences. 
Technically, working with an OSC camera is no different. OSC cameras have monochrome sensors, and those sensors have what's called a Bayer layer over them, it's built in, which divides light out into red, green, and blue. So that a one-shot color camera captures a red, green, and blue channel every time it's used. And the camera puts together the light information from all three of these channels to also make a luminance channel. And what I've done in the image above is simply rework the colors from each one of those channels to emulate what one might see with a narrowband camera. As I'm assigning color based on my preferences, it's just as valid. The image that you're seeing is the real image. It's not made up. It's not photoshopped. I've simply assigned, based on my preferences, different color values to different regions of the frame. Now, cooled cameras are also very expensive due to the cooling units. The cooling units are specifically meant to cool the sensors of the camera. And we're not going to get too deep into the technical details at this time. But cooling the sensors is a way of preventing the buildup of noise. However, modern cameras are pretty resistant to noise. In fact, I've been using the Player One Uranus C for about a year now. And the biggest problem I have, the only real problem, is dust accumulating on the lens of the telescope. I live in a very rural area, and the air, especially in spring, is rich with pollen. So from about the time it warms in spring to mid-June, about once a week, I have to carefully clean the telescope lens. As far as noise, it's absolutely minimal, regardless of the fact that this is an uncooled camera. And the only thing that I really use to minimize the impact of noise and the appearance of a little bit of dust on the telescope lens is in the mornings I shoot some calibration frames. In particular, I shoot only flats and dark flats. And quite frankly, that's enough. Partly because these modern cameras are very, very good at eliminating their own noise problems, including things like amp glow. And whatever noise does manage to get through is easily removed in the process of photo editing. Now, I think astrophotographers have a tendency to say, well, you need to get the actual original image to be perfect. If you do it in photo editing, it's invalid. At least I see that kind of attitude on many of the boards that I frequent. But realistically, it's just as good and just as valid to use electronic editing. I mean, this whole process, when you think about it, is electronic. We're using electronic sensors to capture and gather light. We're using software to assign that light to a certain chrominance and luminosity and contrast and dynamic range values. And it's perfectly valid to remove noise and other unwanted artifacts through editing. So I'm not saying that if you have a monochrome cooled camera and a nice filter set, you should toss it in the garbage. What I am saying is that if you've been wanting to get into astrophotography, but you are intimidated by the cost, and I got to tell you, I was intimidated myself for a long time by the cost. I look at the cost of a mount here in Canada, a decent mount was $2,600. That's not pocket change. And the cost of a decent refractor was a thousand bucks, also not pocket change. And then on top of that, the cost of a decent cooled camera is another $1,500 to $2,000, and yet easily another thousand on a filter wheel and filters, and twice that if you get good ones. Uh, the whole cost of this was, was incredible. Well, for those of you who are intimidated by the cost, what I'm saying is that right now, with the technology where it stands, right now, you can take absolutely gorgeous images, 95% or better, as good as images shot with a cooled monochrome camera with a filter wheel. With a $400 color camera with nothing but an active cooling unit, like a little fan behind it. And by the way, I barely ever use that active cooling unit, only on the hottest nights of summer. In fact, another YouTuber who goes by the name Luca Matico has a video where he was shooting on a night of 30 degrees Celsius in the UK and his Uranus C performed just fine. So get out there, discover the sky, learn its story and have fun. Money is still a bit of a barrier to entering astrophotography, but at least you don't have to break the bank anymore on a cold monochrome camera with filters. A decent planetary OSC, a modern camera that resists amp glow and noise will do just fine. You should invest in a dual or triple band filter for best results. And you'll need to invest a little time and money in getting the processing software and learning how to use it. But modern technology has made the overall cost of getting into astrophotography much lower.